This is Michelle River for Erie River Publishing, and today we are here launching our year-long anthology. Yes, it took us a whole year to put this together. Monsters and Mayhem, that's 24 amazing stories of, believe it or not, monsters that cause mayhem. Um, there's go. I feel like there's haunted dolls, so I can say a ghost. Um, vampires, werewolves, wendigos. Windigos, ghouls, um, fairies, so many exciting and unique and interesting um, um, monsters, like those tropes, those horror monster tropes that we just classic monsters we love. And we really hope that you enjoy this collection. Today we have four. <laughs> Wait, no, five. I do know how to count originally. We have five authors with us. We have Chris Hewitt, uh, Georgia Cook, Ian Neely, David Green, and Shelby Sutterman. And they are all here to talk about their stories and everything else. Now, Erie River Publishing is a small independent publishing house. We are um, located in Ontario, Canada, um, which is in Canada. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't matter it's a running joke that only one other person gets anyways um so um we are here um trying to highlight and um <laughs> emphasize uh the written word of horror dark fiction dark fantasy um and uh really just <laughs> Sorry, I see someone on below doing something silly um, and uh, showcasing and highlighting really some amazing indie authors. So I'm really excited to uh, show all of you guys. We have lots of different books, but again, this is our second year that we've done the yearly one. Um, this one is Monsters and Mayhem and um, it is out live now. You can get in paperback, ebook and a hardcover. So let me introduce our authors. I'm going to start with uh, Georgia Cook. Hello. Hi. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. How good. are you? It's nice to see you. Um, it's nice to have you here. Uh, you actually have two in this one, don't you? I do, yes. Excellent. I think it's Old Gods and Witches, I think, are my two. Yes. Um, so I'm excited to hear a little bit more about those, but let's introduce uh, Ian Neely. Hello. Hi. How are you today? Good. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. That's perfect. Um, what is the story that you wrote this time around? Uh, not this time around. Which? What is the theme that uh, you have your story in for? Uh, it's uh, for uh, mummies. Uh, I wrote mummies. The Woman in the World. Yes. Okay, so. excellent. So we've got lots of different already, like three different kind of monsters. And then, oh, sorry, David, I didn't even say it. I just clicked. I'm like, he's ready. It's a good job that I was ready. And I just, I well, I wasn't ready. I, I <laughs> Yeah, I just uh, stared into space, really. That was, that's exactly. what I really uh, so we have David Green. Nice to see you again. Now, what yeah. story, what's your theme that you got into this one? Uh, I did vampires. Vampires. I was very surprised about. I was surprised with anyone, really. That it won? Or that, like, you wrote No, I'm, I'm not into vampires, it. really, at all. So it's just like, well, <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, yeah, it's just one of those things. Well, we're excited to have you here. And then next up is going to be Chris. So hello, Chris. How are you? Good, good, good. Hi. What was your, I know what your story was about. Well, tell the audience, what was your story about today? Uh, so mine was Aliens. No surprise there. <laughs> Talk That's about really one trick well. pony. Um, yeah, in November. Uh, so I wrote a short story called Little Stars, which I'll be reading in a minute. Um, perfect. Well, it was, um, I think you did, yeah, I'm going to do the next one. I. I keep wanting to start small talk because that's what I do. And I'm like, I need to introduce more people. All right, Shelby Sutterman, you are last Suderman. but not least. Did I say it wrong? It's Suderman. Suderman, I apologize. That's okay. 
Shelby Suderman, what is, uh, this is your first time you've been published with Erie River, is it? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. And your, what was your story about? Uh, mine was about, uh, the prompt was for fairies. Mm -hmm. So uh, the simple one line story that I've been giving is it's about uh, a young guy in his 20s and he goes for a walk and he gets lost and bad things happen to him. Yikes. <laughs> well, no, exactly. So we're going to go um, later on. We're going to uh, individually go through our authors and everyone's going to do a little bit of a reading um, or just give us a little bit more of an intro to their story, whatever they're, uh, they kind of want to do. Um, but in the meantime, why don't you just tell us everyone um, what you uh, normally write and what everyone else can, uh, where people can find you in your stories. Um, so Georgia, what do you normally write? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I usually write quite a lot of um, horror and spectre fiction. So a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of urban fantasy as well. And uh, I write for quite a few audio things, so podcasts, which I also do uh, voice work for. Oh, so you can find me cool. on Twitter at Georgia Cooked and uh, at my website, Georgia Cook Writer. Oh, excellent. Uh, Ian Neely, where can we find you and what do you write? Uh, I kind of wear two different hats. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I sort of write fiction under Ian Neely. Uh, and then I have a very, my, which is a, a pen name of my, of my real name, which is Ian Neely. Uh, and I write um, nonfiction uh, okay. journalism. Nonfiction uh, journalism. Adult. Well, that is a huge difference. How did you get yeah. into like switching, not switching, but like, do you find one easier than the other? Uh, I think they both present a fair amount of challenges in their own way. Um, it was just, it got confusing because I was writing a lot of fiction under my, you know, my given name and, yeah. uh, and my journalism was kind of clashing up against it. So I went as Ian Neely. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think they, they're both challenging and uh, both uh, amazingly gratifying if you can, yeah. can kind of tap into it correctly. So, yeah. Well, that's exciting. Where can we find you? Do you have websites or? Uh, yeah. So under my regular name, which is Ian dot com, uh, you can find uh, my website and my uh, my nonfiction writing and books. Uh, OK. So. All right. Excellent. Um, Shelby, tell us about you. Where can we find you? What are you writing right now? Um, so right now I've uh, got a few horror short stories that I'm working on and I've got, like, I, I tend to write a blend, a blend between like horror, sci-fi and fantasy. So right now I do have a, a sci-fi project on the back burner as I try and get these done first, but, uh, I can be found at... Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, I believe I'm at Shelby Suderman. And then yeah. uh, on Facebook, I have an author page now. Now, I believe it's just Shelby Suderman author page. Okay. All right. Well, it's good to have. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and do you pr primarily find yourself writing like a specific genre or are you like hop hopping through different genres as well? Um. I tend to try to have like something of each of those genres going at the same time. That's just like where my brain goes. Like I'll, I'll yeah. need to do some of this and some of this and then some of that or whatever. So perfect. It's a bit of each. Right. Like I have. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Chris. What about you? Where can we find you? And what are you primary? Like, what are you writing right now? <laughs> you know what I'm writing right now. I know. What, um, I know what you're writing. Right now. <laughs> so at the moment, I'm writing. Uh, I'm like you better yes. be writing that right yeah. now. Yeah, prequels and sequels of various bits and pieces, um, <laughs> but mainly sci-fi, fantasy, um, horror. So the usual gamut of yeah. uh, re themes. Um, and yeah, I can be found on muse.blog, dot blog. M U S E D dot blog. All right, perfect. All right, David. I know you don't have a lot of projects on the go, but where can we find you? <laughs> I don't have a lot of projects on the go at the moment. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done with my last one. Uh, no, I, I, I actually started work on the next Nick Colloran book today, which was which was fun. Going in the kind, oh, kind very of very exciting. I, I kind of started work on it a little bit. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, you, can, you can find me, best place to play me is my website, which is davidgreenwriter.com, and it has links to everything on, on there. All right, perfect. All right. Uh, well, we've got a couple of people saying hi. So hello, Emily and Rachel. Hi. If you're watching right now, please feel free to say hi. If you have any questions, uh, where do you get your ideas? Uh, we will address that at the end. <clears throat> Uh, where we're, we'll go through all the different comments and questions. Um, but right now, what we're going to do is we're going to start with Georgia. So we're going to say goodbye to everybody else. So goodbye. salutations. I think that works. Uh, again, if I accidentally kick any of the authors out, please, please just join again. It's just me not knowing buttons. It's not a personal thing for most people. But Georgia. <laughs> so you do audio as well. I do. Yes. I write for a couple of podcasts. Oh, I might have to talk to you about <laughs> If you need a British accent for anything. Um, always. <laughs> we, we've got books. We should talk. Uh, but tell, let's talk about the book right now, Monsters and Mayhem. Um, this one, again, you, uh, for those that aren't aware, we do a month, well, last year, we did a monthly call. This year, we switched it to quarterly. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a monthly call to build an anthology. So we had two um, stories a month. They went to our patron. Um, and then they're all being compiled, or they were, they are all compiled into this um, anthology, which is Monsters in Mayhem. And you've got two stories in there. So why don't you tell I us did. About, um, tell us about your first one. Like, what was the inspiration behind this? Give us a little bit of so what we know, because I think it's it is the first one that's in the book as well. So it um, is it's just oof, a bit scary. Uh, so I think the first one is Foundations, which was for the theme of old gods. And I think I wrote this one and I wasn't entirely sure if it fit the theme. And I thought, I, I quite like it. I think I'll, I'll put it in anyway, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. And um, it's all about two women who go caving in uh, this network of caves yeah. and uh, the things that they find down there. And uh, I really like the idea of sort of trapped gods and kind of what happens yeah. to gods after you sort of stop believing in them and where do they go? Yeah. And I think I was watching a lot of YouTube videos about uh, the deepest cave network in the world and what people think is down there and kind of the tappings and the voices that people hear deep, deep underground. I think it all kind of worked its way right. into that. Yeah. No, I really, uh, I really loved that story. I think people are going to really enjoy just overall the vibe of it is so interesting and cool. Um, and it almost seems like it could be real now because that demon boulder did you hear about the demon boulder that cracked yes that that's cracked supposed open. to be housing like yes. this demon god <laughs> as if we needed anything else i know <laughs> oh. but yes yeah, so it almost it, it's kind of interesting to see how that uh kind of comes into play with what's going on in your not that they are exactly the same thing but still i thought it was kind of funny um, and the second one was, we have old gods, and the second one was? Uh, no, the first one was The Deepest Dark, and then the yeah. second one was Foundations, which okay, is for witches. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. And, uh, um, yeah. Sorry, I wish I had the book in front of me, but again, I was supposed to be getting it on the 13th <laughs> yes. or something stupid. Like, it was, it was supposed to be here on Monday, and I was hoping it would be here by the weekend, but it's now coming on Monday or Tuesday. Um, but I, I think people are going to love, love, love the story, um, especially the one that, both of them, but especially the one that opens it, it just really sets a really awesome tone for the entire oh, thank um, you. collection. I'm really glad that you submitted it, and I love reading your work, just like always. Oh, thank so. you. I, I really enjoyed all the different themes, like, even if I didn't find something that I felt was good enough to submit, I, I still tried to write a story for every single theme. Oh, very to get cool. Stories I'm glad rolling. to hear that. Yeah. It's good. Like, sometimes you need just, sometimes it's nice to have a little bit outside of. Yeah, just, uh, just a prompt. Right? Just a, yeah. Yeah, a prompt is amazing. So thank you so much for writing. And um, uh, yeah, you've got two in here. So we'll hopefully see more from you soon now. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Georgia at all? I'm just trying to see. We already 
to hear the where did you get your ideas we can't use oh my gosh dave is just asking a question to chris but i will deal with that later <laughs> i talk to you uh, but we've got a hello so hello uh, but again, really amazing stories, and I can't wait for people to dig in on it. Actually, if you do have Amazon, like if you want to pick it up on Amazon, you can read it at booksto-read.com. Um, because your story is the first one, I believe it's even in the sneak preview. So if anyone oh. wants to read that one, they can probably see it right in the sneak preview. <laughs> I know. Well, look at that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining. We'll talk to you in just, again, a little bit. Um, but do you want to remind anyone where they can find your stuff while we're here? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Georgia Cooked, as in cooking something, and on my website at georgiacookwriter.com. All right, perfect. All right, we will talk to you soon. I'm just going to, again, try to remove you, but not kill you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was Georgia. Next up, we have David Green. He is ready this time. Uh -huh. I announced it. You said it really, really kind of slowly as well, like I was in trouble or something. Yes, I, I, I would like to know. <laughs> you want to know the best story through beta red lately? Okay, yeah. well, you are in this one, and uh, I'm actually surprised that you had time to write, um, even for me, but for like a, a, a short story, because your schedule is so filled with, um, Path of War and Hollerin and all these other crazy things that you do. Well, um, I kind of cut I cut out a lot of the crazy stuff, so I have more time to write for you now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah well, this I, I, this was like May, I think this was, wasn't it? So it was May last year. So um, I think uh, I might have just been. I think I think I just finished working on on uh, our kind of edits for um, the two Hollerin books, and I was like. I have time to write something and you know I, I wanted to be in at least one of these so i was like i think the, the 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 prompt was vampires and i was like uh i'm not really into vampires all that much but i'll think of something and uh yeah i just just kind of hit upon something yeah and, uh, what's that <laughs> I mean, well it turned out really interesting and like alana who was the one that was editing and reading them really enjoyed the story and she, obviously because she picked it um so it's I, I think it I think it it goes really well in the whole collection as as well it's it's interesting and it's got uh, a little bit of your personality in it which is always I'm sure some people enjoy so <laughs> I hope some people do I know I know most yeah, exactly. people probably don't uh, yeah well, it was we're going to find out because you're going to do a small reading of it are you not I will do a small reading of it yeah um, it was basically <laughs> like you know I was kind of thinking like if I was a vampire and being extreme like going out and hunting people sounds very very like just like it sounds like a lot of work so i was like what's the easiest way of bringing blood to me uber. basically yeah <laughs> uber bring them up you got any fresh blood from anyone so that's yeah um no it's so well it's a really it's an interesting concept and i think it's yeah like i said it's I hope I, I I know that a lot of people will enjoy it. So um, I'm going to leave you to it. If you want to give a little bit of a prompt, you can. If you want to just get right into it, get right into it. Anyone that is watching, if you do have any questions, feel free, please, to put them in the comments, and we will get to them um, after the reading. And I'm going to try to get myself out of the stream and not turn this whole thing off. Okay, we're still we're still going. Um, apologies for my voice. Usually it's pretty bad, but it's really bad at the moment, but we'll get through it. So this is called Midnight Shift. Um, basically, it was vampires. So I kind of had this idea of um, how would vampires in modern day, who would do a quite lazy and didn't want to get caught and hunt with people, get blood. So I was like, why don't they open a uh, blood donation place? And that's how they can get a lot of blood. So that was basically the idea of the story. And then uh yeah that was it so i'll start reading a little bit of it now so it's called midnight shift i guess this is it jet gave the sign a dubious second look a flickering bulb illuminated it giving sporadic light to a filth encrusted logo that hadn't seen a wet cloth since john R wayne rode horses and drank milk if it ever boasted words the years had eroded them he checked the text that the agency sent just to make certain Premium life, midnight shift, 
Get there a little early for orientation. Wear something nice, but not a suit. Abrupt, odd, and not too formal. It came with a GPS location too, and that had led Chet to the grime-encrusted side street off a side street that he never would have stumbled upon if his cell hadn't brought him there. It's a job, Chet, he muttered, eyeing the building. Looked deserted. He should go home, sign up for yet another agency. His last company had sent nothing but bum jobs his way, though, and the new one he'd discovered, Alcard de Dynasties, came through straight away, a desk job that paid bank. $600 a night, can't say no to that. One drawback, late hours. Chet had given it a minute's thought before shrugging. He played Xbox all night and slept most of the day, then woke up for more gaming. A midnight shift wouldn't change much. 600 bucks a night would. Problem was, the joint with the filth encrusted sign above it didn't scream $600 a night, nor did a job at a blood bank called Premium Life. Chet lit a cigarette, the smoke spreading its tendrils deeper into the abandoned side street. Then a thought rang a bell in his head, sounding like a gong. He narrowed his eyes. No homeless. Not one, and Haven has them everywhere. Dated flyers peeled from the walls, doctors advertising their skills for those without insurance, more offering phone numbers lonely fellas could call. He shrugged off the urge to punch the digits into his cell. Even a private detective called Nick Holleran saying he'd take the cases, others wouldn't. The usual ads for the seedier parts of town. He smiled. Place must have, must have just moved here, moved the drifters along. Blood banks had to look clean. Okay, this joint didn't right, didn't right now, but they'd hire Chet from an agency. They needed staff and fast. The high rate of pay compensated for the late hours. It all made sense. The dark sky is opening and spilling its contents onto his head made up Chet's mind. He detested rain. Wincing, Chet threw his half-smoked cigarette on the ground, the downpour snuffing it out, and raced across the side street, his boots echoing the, on the slick cobbles. Another thing he hated was wasting his smokes, but he couldn't go waltzing into a blood bank with a cigarette stuck to his lips. I'd look like a badass, though. Grin fixed on his face, Chet drew a hand across his forehead, moving the dripping hair from his eyes, then wiped his palms on his damp denim jacket and tried the handle. Locked. He rattled it again. No difference. A third time didn't help matters either. Chet knocks instead. A flurry of rapid taps as water ran down the gap between his collar and neck, making him squirm. Come on, he growled, trying the handle again. Shit, maybe it's the wrong goddamn place. Frustration made his foot kick out, his booted toes thudding against the bottom of the door. Chet did it again, then drew his leg back to give it a harder one, blaming the stupid door for his idiotic cell taken into the wrong place on his first night when light oozed from beneath the, the frame. About time. He gave the glass another rattle with his knuckles and replaced a scowl on his face with a smile. The door swung open and the grin slipped away like tears in the rain. Chet fancied himself a good-looking guy, on an orthodox kind of handsome maybe, which explained the years he spent single, but the figure framed by premium life's artificial light put the reflection he admired in the mirror more times than he should each day to shame. raven wing hair, framed unblemished porcelain, with razor-edged cheekbones on the verge of poking through the snow-white skin covering them. Clad in a rich maroon suit, the man loomed over Chet, Craning his neck, he took in the full ruby lips that curved downwards, almost in a petulant pout, before meeting black eyes that shone like polished obsidian stones. Despite the sweaty, humid dampness, Chet's skin broke out in, into goosebumps. He wanted nothing more to pull his, than to pull his stare away, but Chet's willpower deserted him. For this nameless stranger, he'd do anything. Say wh whatever he demanded. Shit, Chet would work for free. Screwed us at the $600. Chet Phillips, he nodded in return, still fixed on those cold, all-seeing orbs, tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. Punctual, a fine trait. My name is Peter. The maroon-clad Adonis blinked and broke the spell. Chet shifted his stare, instead finding a point in the middle distance over Peter's shoulder of stunning interest. Easier than meeting the man's eyes again. Ah, yeah, he croaked. Chet tried to work up some moisture in his mouth, but came up dry. 
Uh, that's that's me, ready to start. Of course. Peter spun on his heel and glided into premium life. Chet followed. His heavy footsteps a sharp reminder of his gracelessness compared to the perfection who lowered himself into a seat behind the room's only desk. Wait, I'm straight. Why am I thinking like this? Nerves. First night nerves. And this place ain't what you call normal. And I think I'll leave it there so I don't go on for too long. Okay, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Great reading. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. So you've been to uh, off doing um, playing for the last couple of days, and that's why you heard your throat. Yeah, I, I yeah, it was uh, it wasn't because I finished writing Path of War that we went to Disneyland. It was it was already pre-planned, which is why I had to finish Path of War before we went to Disneyland, <laughs> yeah. which meant I had to write. I spent 10 hours writing last Saturday and then uh, went to Disneyland for Paris for the for the week with my son and my throat is destroyed. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're uh, very excited to read what's coming up, but we're also very excited to read your the rest of your vampire story for this one. And again, you can pick that up. Um, Universal Link is books to read at Monsters uh, Mayhem. <clears throat> Uh, but we're also selling it directly through our own website uh, at PayHip. Um, so if you have us on Erie River Publishing, you can go there and it's only 99 cents for the first week. So, um, but thanks so much. Thank uh, I'm going to see if there's any, there's no questions. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to give your voice a break for a little bit. You can talk to us later. <laughs> but thank you for coming and thank you for reading. It's nice to see you. All right. You're welcome. I appreciate that. You're so polite. It's because you're Canadian. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm Canadian. All right. We've got E N Neely. E N Neely. <laughs> I enjoy the how you did that because I'm like, thank even you. When I was reading this before, I'm like, his name's Ian. It's just the same thing. <laughs> so now I don't feel yeah. silly if I say Ian because yeah, it's that's, Ian. that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> me putting the words together <laughs> um tell us a little bit about this story that you have um in this one you know i i was i traveled to uh the czech republic a couple of years ago and yeah. uh, i got a chance to uh uh tour uh the castle of franz ferdinand uh that franz ferdinand from world war one uh just before and uh i learned that the castle um during World War II was taken over by the Nazis and that the Nazis had done that quite a bit. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense really because you had these castles sort of set up in geographically important places and they would sort of take them over. Um, and so I started thinking about it and I was like, well, what if he had, you know, I mean, yeah, something really terrible happened to Nazis and that's that's never a bad thing. They only That's only a good thing. You know, no matter yeah. how much bad happens to a Nazi, you're kind of like, okay, that's okay. Uh, and so I, I, I put a, yeah, yeah. And so I, I put a bunch of really bad Nazis, um, you know, in a castle in an old chateau on the border of France and Germany yeah. and uh, mixed in a little bit of the occult and, mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, they run into something in the basement. <laughs> All right. Perfect. And we will leave it at that. Are you, uh, are you good for having a little bit of a reading today? Sure. I'd be happy to. Okay. Perfect. No, I'm, uh. So I'm, again, I will leave you two and then we'll come up. If anybody has any questions about the story or anything like that, please put the comments uh, below. Uh, but if not, here we go. Enjoy your reading. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, jump sort of into a little bit of the middle of the story, uh, simply because the beginning of the story has got a lot of German in it and uh, my uh, pronunciations are horrific. Uh, so I'll be starting uh, here on, on uh, page 130 of this a uh, beautiful uh, book. <clears throat> Several officers and the garrison's sickly looking commander greeted him as he entered the building. Something about the demeanor of the soldiers bothered him. They were far from the front and yet they were nervous. The makeshift mess hall was quiet as men picked up their food. He knew his presence should inspire some level of anxiety, but this was too much. Richter found it concerning. 
He insisted on seeing the prisoner as soon as possible. It was better to get this part over with. The sergeant and a second lieutenant led him through the castle, up a flight of stairs to the third floor, and into his room. It can wait until morning, can it not? The lieutenant asked. Wait until morning, Richter asked, shaking his head. Why would I do that? No, you'll take me to see her this evening. Of course, sir. The lieutenant's hand trembled slightly as he turned the door handle, a detail Richter had not missed. The room was small, but he took the opportunity to freshen up. Distant thunder rattled the little window by the bed. He wasted no time. The sooner he got started, the sooner he could, he could return to Berlin. Then a thought dawned on him, and he stopped. The soldiers weren't afraid because of his arrival. Something else had them scared. Not bothering to even change his uniform, Richter returned to the hallway, where he was escorted back through the castle to the basement level. Supplies and crates of ammunition lay in the hallway, which he pretended not to see. He loathed disorganization. He passed an alcove made into a makeshift radio room where an operator listened intently to the chatter through the headset. We're still opening up parts of the castle, the lieutenant said, trying, uh, seeing his look of disapproval. Many portions were collapsed. Uh, some areas are being cleared for the first time in perhaps decades. Richter said nothing. With the help of the sergeant, the lieutenant forced open the door to the basement. The thick wood groaned and shuddered as they forced it wide. The smell of wet and rot was overpowering. He made no outward sign of his discomfort as they followed the string of buzzing, flickering lights down the stone stairs. There were several rooms here filled with ancient boxes and equipment he could not identify. He stopped and brushed off the dust from one crate. There was writing on it in German. What is this? he asked. We were not the first ones here in the castle, said the lieutenant. We believe it was used during the Great War, at least for a short time. Richter blew more dust off and squinted at the writing. Von Cairo Buck Berlin, he said. What's inside the crates? Clay jars, topped with little sculpted animal heads, said Sergeant Mueller. Richter turned to the two men and raised an eyebrow. Worthless antiquities. Some unimportant small jars and pots dug up from an uh, excavation in Cairo, the lieutenant said. What's in them? Richter asked. We believe, the lieutenant said, stepping backward and taking the lantern's light off the boxes, that they're filled with dried human remains. Richter frowned, wiping his hand, wiping his hand on his pant leg. Organs, mostly. Dug up and left here by some half-wit archaeologists during the Great War, Richter mused. Is there more here? More trash dug up from the tombs and discarded. Most of it is on this level, sir. We've been busy and haven't made an inventory of it all, the lieutenant said. Richter turned and continued to follow as the two men led him to a wooden door slick with mold. He noted someone had recently bolted a lock to the outside. She isn't here, sir, the lieutenant said. Is she restrained? No, Halpen Sumfjord. He eyed the man, then shrugged and unclasped his gun holster with a practice flick of his thumb. The sergeant then handed him the lantern. She sits in the dark. The lieutenant and sergeant made eye contact. Yes, sir. Then I will speak with her. I don't plan to take long. Wait here and shut the door behind me. The men nodded as he tugged on the stubborn wooden door that led him inside. He heard it close behind him with a thick, wet sound. The lantern did little to chase away the shadows. So he let his eyes adjust to the room. There was an untouched tray of food by the door. For a moment, he entertained the thought that this was some sort of double cross, which the party had become susceptible in recent months. Had he just allowed himself to be locked up for some imaginary transgression? The room smelled of dirt, cinnamon, and something that he couldn't place. The feeling of foreboding once again wrapped around him. Clenching his teeth, refusing to give in, he waited until his eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, and he saw the silhouette of a woman standing at the far end. So I think I'll leave it there. Hi, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed your story. It has a really cool, just with the scene that you set, where you put it, it has like a really, really cool vibe throughout. Um, 
I really just really, really love it. Um, we've got a comment that says great voices and words. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. It was a blast All the great write. words. Yeah. <laughs> I you. really enjoy it. Yeah. Is there, did you like, is there a part of the story that you just personally really loved writing or did you, I, I feel like everyone connects to like something or they laugh at one part of annihilation. So was there anything in particular that you really enjoyed <laughs> in this one? Or? Yeah. I mean, um, when, you know, I think we were sort of leading up to it when he's first introduced, you know, to the, the thing in the room. Yeah. Uh, it's it's particularly spooky, and there's a there's a a bit where he kind of imagines something he can't see, and it's really spooky. Uh, and I really like that, and uh, and then kind of tying it in to the end to really sort of make what his fears were that he was kind of imagining come true uh, was uh, particularly delightful. So that Excellent. was fun. It's always good when you can like have a little bit of joy in your destruction. Yeah, right? Absolutely, like, yeah, for I sure. love it. I love it. That's perfect. Okay, remind us again where we can um, find you and read some of your other stuff. Uh, so um, Ian Neely is, is is my pen name, and um, I'm sort of just now kind of writing fiction under that pen name. Okay. Um, my 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 given name is Ian Neely, uh, N E L I G H, and uh, I've got a a couple of uh, published nonfiction sort of uh, history books. Uh, and, uh, and some other fiction writing and, and various anthologies out there. Yeah. Uh, so ianneely.com is where you can find most of it. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was great to meet you. Absolutely. And, my pleasure. Uh, yeah. We'll say hi at the end, see if anyone else has any comments and we'll go from Sounds there. But good. Thanks, thanks so much for thanks. reading. You bet. All right. See you in a bit. All right. And Chris, you are up next. Are you ready? You know, I'm just putting him on. Yeah, he's ready. Hi. Oh, there hi. he is. How are you today? Good, good, good. That's good. Good. On the brink nice of World War Three. It's going well. Oh, that's perfect. <laughs> um, so, tell us a little bit about the story that you wrote. We know it's about aliens. Give us a little bit. Was there yeah. any inspiration for it? Not really. In fact, I, I started writing a different story to the one that ended up on the page simply because it was one of those ones where it kind of got halfway through. And then you realized it was going to blow the word limit, the usual <laughs> problem. Um, so in fact, it was kind of really a, um, the story I started writing was utterly different. Um, and they're, they're all around theme. I think the back end of last year, I seem to be writing alien stories about alien invasions or alien encounters where the aliens are not, um, not aware of what they're doing. So they're not evil. They're not. Yeah. You know, the click, typical alien they're not predators they're not it's the usual one you go through the usual gamut of what people are likely to write for a particular theme and you don't write that one but i was surprised that this one made it actually because um it it's not hardcore horror throughout the whole thing it's just got yeah. a very well i think one of the a very good ending <laughs> yeah. um the horror is all in the ending yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's more of sometimes it's not necessarily it's how well written it, it is and how much it sticks to the theme, too. Mm -hmm. um, so this I know this uh, collection, we've got a lot of different variations and level of horror. That's the nice thing about the Monsters and Mayhem one. It isn't all just like punch you in the face, scare you yeah, and yeah. Then rip out your insides and, you know, like have yeah. a. Only on Fingers. the last line. <laughs> Only on the yeah. last line. <laughs> exactly. So uh, it's really, it's nice to see the, the different levels coming through and the different writing styles and takes on it. But uh, I'm going to, are you okay with doing a small sampling of reading in, for sure. everyone? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will leave you to that. If anyone has any questions, again, please feel free to put it in the bottom. Uh, but if not, it doesn't matter if not. I don't know why I keep saying if not. We will see you soon. I'm going to, I'm heading off. Enjoy this piece. <laughs> Yours. Okie doke. So yeah, this was, um, I think it was November, uh, the aliens theme. And uh, my story's called Little Stars. Um, okay. Look, mum, said Elle, rushing from the garden, holding up a multicolored glowing jam jar. Look how they shine. I've got at least 20 now. Sue stood on the porch, arms crossed. That's great, hun, but it's time for bed. 
she confiscated Elle's homemade butterfly net, receiving a huffy pout for her parenting efforts. Her daughter stumped off indoors, chin resting on her clutched prize. But it's too bright to sleep. I know, but it's gone midnight and you've got school tomorrow. The vibrant northern lights bathed the valley blue-green, bright enough to see the town of Pensacola nestled at the base of the distant Blue Ridge Mountains. The townsfolk partied, the caution of the first night, abandoned for a global Mardi Gras as everyone reveled in the cosmic spectacle. By the second night, the cavorting aura borealis had become a backdrop to an even more wondrous sight as motes of neon lights floated like dandelion seeds on the wind. Tonight, there wasn't a parent in the neighbourhood that could keep their children indoors. Can I take them to school? yelled Elle from the bathroom, toothbrush buzzing. I guess, just make sure you wash your hands. Sue followed the trail of discarded clothes, picking up the jam jar and placing it on the bedside table before closing the curtains. The thin fabric could do little to block out the emerald glow. Sat on the bed, she scrutinised the luminous motes floating in the jar, defying gravity. The news said they were harmless, solar snowflakes, a crystalline peculiarity of the sun's unusual mass ejection. There was no denying they were beautiful. I bet no one got more than me, not even Thomas, and he caught free last night, said Elle, bounding into bed. Sue pulled the covers up and tucked her daughter in. We'll see. Remember, quality, not quantity. I'm sure yours will be the brightest. After all, you're my bright little star. Sweet dreams. She kissed Elle on the forehead and retreated, the pulsing contents of the jam jar almost too bright for a nightlight. Mom, a single word uttered a hundred times a day, so, so familiar that its subtle inflection communicated endless meaning. This time it spoke of procrastination. What? They tickled. I'm sure they did. Now go to sleep. Sue returned to the porch to watch the festivities, music and laughter echoing up the valley. A glass of wine, her only exuberance. A glance at a phone confirmed the cell network remained down, as it had been since the solar flare started. Thankfully, they'd not seen the power cuts reported in other countries. No internet, no phones. Part of, it considered a, part of her considered it a small price to pay to witness this once-in-a-lifetime event in peace. What tale she'd have to tell her grandchildren. She held out her hand to catch a floating red moat. It fizzed as it melted on the back of her hand. It was right. They tickled. With a groan, Sue turned off the alarm clock and stumbled bleary eye to the bathroom. L, time to get up. Fifteen minutes later, feeling almost human, she peeked in on her daughter. L lay unmoving in her bed. L, come on. Coffee, orange juice, and a splash of milk on a bowl of cocoa crispies, and Sue was getting annoyed. L, come on, we're going to be late. Where's your homework? Silence. She marched into her daughter's room and pulled back the curtains, eliciting a muffled moan from under the covers. Come on, homework, where did you leave it? Mum. The word oozed sickness, often faked, but Sue knew the difference. She sat on the bed. What's up? I don't feel well. You're tired, too many late nights. Sue's hand snaked under the covers in search of Elle's forehead, her cold and clammy forehead. Oh, you're frozen. She threw back the covers, feeling her daughter's icy body frozen but for the odd patches of warmth. Closer investigation revealed dozens of angry red welts, many on her daughter's fingertips where she'd been catching the moats. Sue brushed aside Elle's hair and ran a trembling finger over a raised bump over her daughter's right eye, a knuckle nestled against Elle's left earlobe, a thumbnail-sized volcano. Mum, panicked urgency, hardwired to trigger Sue's motherly instincts, but this time the call came too late. Elle vomited over the side of bed and it was all Sue could do to hold back her daughter's hair. As the retching eased, Elle shivered into a fetal position and Sue wrapped her in the folds of the blanket. Mind racing, she replayed her daughter's last few days in her head, searching for a cause. Plant, insect, bacterial, viral. Yes, viral, there was always some play going around the school. OK, no school for you today. I'll be right back. She returned with a bucket of supplies and pushed an electronic thermometer into Elle's ear. A beep and she stared, perplexed, at the digital readout. 33? Uh, is that good for a popsicle, honey? Why are you so cold? Elle shook her head, a chill that snaked up Sue's spine. A fever she could understand. Elle had seen her fair share of childhood illnesses. But hypothermia? She ran her fingers over the red marks, warm, almost hot, against the daughter's frigid, goosebump skin. A second reading from Elle offered only, two, only more concern. 32? 
okay, we need to get you warmed up. Sue Pordell's frozen body close, hands rubbing up and down her back, willing her body's warmth into her daughter. It's okay. You've just got a bit of a chill is all. K-K-K-K, L stuttered. I'm going to run a warm bath. Sue wrapped another blanket around her daughter and snuggled Elle's favourite teddy bear beside her head. The welt above Elle's eye seemed bigger, angrier. Stay here, stay warm. Sue filled the bath, wandering to the kitchen to retrieve her cell phone. Damn it, no signal, no messages, no intimate. Typical. She tossed the useless device aside, closed her eyes and rubbed her temples, considering her next move. The landline, she'd almost cancelled it. When was the last time she used it? The purring welcome the dial tone was music to her ears, and she dialed the only number she knew. A woman's voice answered. Sue didn't hesitate. My daughter is ill, her body temperature is plummeting, and I... We're experiencing a high volume of calls at the moment. She stared at the phone in disbelief. Please, I need an ambulance. Hang on the line for one of our operators. If this is an emergency... Of course it's a fucking emergency. The line died. Hello? Hello? She tapped the receiver, desperate to hear the reassuring tone, fingers curling around the plastic handset as she fought down a rising panic. The hospital was a 30-minute drive, the nearest neighbour, 15. They were on their own. She returned to her daughter's room, wondering what to do. Mum, they're they're, they're dead, said Elle, hugging the empty jam jar. Sue snatched a jar from Elle's hand, several small beads tinkling against the glass. It's daytime. They've gone to sleep. Let's get you warmed up. She scooped up her daughter and carried it to the bathroom. Arms up. Come on, let's go. Her daughter's skin looked almost blue, but for the angry red polka dots. She turned off the faucet and tested the water. Lukewarm, just how do you like it? Ready? Elle nodded or shook. It was impossible to tell as Sue eased the daughter's shivering body into the water. Mom, cried Elle through gritted teeth. Sue had only heard this cry once after Elle fractured her arm, falling from a tree. It was the worst sound in the world. I know, it's okay, it'll pass, just breathe. Elle thrashed, water lapping over the side of the bath as Sue pinned her daughter's shoulders under. Thrashing gave way to squirming, squirming and finally stillness. Better? Elle nodded, her skin flushed red as she took a long, quivering breath. Good, I'll get the thermometer. She ran to the bedroom, sidestepping the sick coating, soaking into the carpet and returned a moment later. Okay, let's see what the thermometer slipped from Sue's hand and rattled across the tiled floor as she stood frozen in the bathroom doorway. L hung in the air, back arched impossibly, tips of the fingers and toes, the only parts touching the water. The marks on our skin glowed red, bright as the neon motes the night before, each one the tip of a burning cigarette. L, she rushed to her daughter's side and stared into her pallid face. Elle's eyelids flickered, eyes rolling back into her head. No, 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 no. Elle, can you hear me? Elle convulsed. Mum? The hairs on Sue's neck bristled. She'd never heard this tone before. It sounded different. Alien. It's okay. I'm right here. And I think I'll stop there. Very cool. My own Elle is coming up the stairs. (laughs) She's floating. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. she's, like, she's about to start she's like, no that was um yeah like i enjoy how you built up um built up um that and uh i thought you were going to end on alien <laughs> it's like oh that's a good line well interesting um, enough i ended on the, the alien bit because um that's where the other story that's the story i was writing went <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's um, and that's where it kind of, yeah, the what would have been a 10, 12,000 story got cut at that point and went <laughs> off in a different direction. That's um, too funny. No, it was, yeah. I really enjoyed the story. It had a good build up. It was interesting and had um, like those elements that you need for that some, like the characters that you just kind of like feel for and like want to make sure are okay. It, it pulled on those types of heartstrings. So I think that's, um, a really good story. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy that about that book, um, about that story. So thank you again for reading and for writing and submitting again. <laughs> um, where can we find you? Just a quick reminder for everybody. Yep. So muse.blog, M-U-S-E-D dot blog is the easiest to say. And on Facebook and Twitter in the usual places. 
All right, perfect. Well, we will see you soon. We have Shelby coming up next. So thank you for joining and uh, we'll see you again in just a little bit. Okay. All right, Shelby. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm not bad, and you? I'm good, I'm good. We can hear you well. So. Okay, good. <laughs> can you matters. hear the fan that's going right now? <laughs> okay, good. At that's least I better. can, so I don't know if anyone else can. Um, but uh, thanks for coming here. Now, this is your first, did you, I heard you say something about this is your first publication? Yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, I, I love being able to have, be like, I popped your publication, Jerry. And I'm okay with that. It's exciting. Okay. It's exciting to get published for the first time. Like it's, um, for me, at least I remember it was just like thrilling. It was like, oh my gosh. Uh, I made yeah. it. I'm officially an author. Someone's giving me money for something. Um, or even if you don't get paid for it, because I didn't get paid for the first couple that I did. It's more yeah. of just like some it's out in the world and like full on strangers can now read it. Like it's tangible. There's like an actual book. So yeah, I can't um, wait to hold it. <laughs> I know. I know. I got to, uh, I got to get those shipped for everybody. Cause it's, Again, the ebook is available now and paperback and hardcover are uh, also available now. And those are available worldwide. Um, people just have to, if, if you want to buy it from an independent store, you just need to go there and let them know because they can order it and grab it for you, or you can buy it online. Um, but tell us about the story that was accepted. Which story are we printing? Uh, so the story is called Nightmares and yeah. it was written, uh, it was picked up in January for the ferry uh, call was what it was. Yeah. So I had written this one for a different uh, call, but that one didn't work out. I just, I didn't have the ending right. It needed to be cleaned up some more. And then I wasn't going to submit it to this one actually, <laughs> but I was like looking at it and I was just like, fairies, technically, I think the creature in this story is a fairy. And I, I did like, I, I was like coming back to him. I was like, well, you know, just, just try it. You know, it'll take yeah. like a couple days, you know, just do the ending again. You know, you've thought about it, you know how to do it now. And like enough time has passed and stuff like that. So I was just like, well, okay, I'll take a couple days. I'll finish it. I'll submit it again. And like, I even like, I, I Googled, like, is this creature fae? Yes. Okay. Is this great. creature fae? So, so that's important because uh, it's important to fit the theme of the story right yes i was just like well because i didn't i wasn't sure if you were like looking for like more like small like pixie fay but like the the pictures you had for the calls weren't like that so i was like okay well i'll try it and if i get in that'd be great if not well i tried it anyway and you know i knew i was just gonna be like i'm gonna be so bad if this passes me by and it's like well i could have done it yeah. And it would have just taken like <laughs> a couple days of work just to exactly. fix it up. Well, you did it and you got in. So tell us a little bit. What's the story um, about? And are you going to do a little reading of it today? Uh, I am. I okay. we had some technical difficulties earlier, but I was able to find it on my computer here. So I am on my phone, on my screen. That's I was right. not going to show you guys this much of a close up of me, but here you are. <laughs> here, I'll go like this. Okay. There we go. Oh, well, I'm I'm excited to hear this story from you. So tell us a little bit about it. And then, um, do you know what? Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about it. And then I will give you this, the entire screen. Okay. Well, this one's a bit difficult to talk about before I read for it. Because... Just read it. Okay. All right. Just throw us I'll right in there. Okay. All right. We'll <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to read a story from Nightmares. Uh, this is going to be uh, starting in the middle. So what we have so far is our main character is named Duncan. He's about 20. He's from the U.S. He is on vacation in Scotland, as it turns out. And he went, he's just kind of, you know, traveling around, you know, doing whatever. And he has this sister who is very scared of a lot of things. And she has like a lot of bad dreams or nightmares, if you will. Uh, so she always like thinks they're gonna come true and stuff like that. So she's always trying to warn him. And she was on the phone just now 
bef before her his phone died basically uh, at the start of the story and she was trying to like warn tell him all about uh you know what she was dreaming of lately and stuff like that and he's like you know i've been dealing with this my whole life my little sister whatever so i'm uh he's not really concerned and because you know he's been dealing with this his whole life so we're gonna start uh just in the middle here to set the scene he is decided to go for a hike he was in uh the Loch Lamond area which from pictures at least it looks beautiful so he decided to go for a hike by himself and now it's dark and he doesn't know where the trail is so we're gonna start there <clears throat> He was dead on his feet by the time he made it out of the wilderness to discover he'd successfully found his way back to the shores of Loch Lomond. For an instant, he stood there, pausing to catch his breath and stare out across the water. With his cell phone dead, he had no idea what time it was. He spotted the ducks splashing around, the only light to see by coming from the full moon reflected off the calm water. Occasionally, their chatter was interrupted by other small animals calling out, each new noise breaking through the low din. Once the birds started singing to each other, he'd know he'd been out until morning. Duncan gazed along the, score, the shoreline in both directions, trying to decide which would lead him back to civilization. He gave up with a weary sigh and picked a direction. He had to find people again eventually. He'd been tramping along for some minutes before a break in his tree line ahead gave him a clear view of something moving. A large, dark shape stood silent on the desolate bank easy to spot as he edged cautiously closer. His eyes had long since adjusted to the dark, but it was only when the creature made a sound that he realized it was a horse. The chatter of ducks abruptly stopped, startling him into casting a glance over his shoulder. The water that had been teeming with, with birds only moments ago now stood calm and empty, but it wasn't just them. The night ambience he'd grown used to in the passing hours had vanished. The horse snorted, and he refocused on the creature ahead. Hey, he answered, hardly daring to breathe in the sudden quiet. The creature stayed where it was, almost like it was waiting for him. Duncan's heart leapt. He scrambled to get closer, moving as fast as he dared, but speaking softly so the creature knew he was coming and wouldn't be spooked by him. How did you get all the way out here? He asked, his voice cutting through the quiet. Do you have a name? He drew up short when he could, when he was finally only feet from it, yet the horse hadn't done more than look at him. His breath caught now that he could see it clearly. He always loved horses, and the one before him was the most magnificent creature he'd ever seen. It towered over him, at least 16 hands, with a midnight black coat. He hesitated, barely remembering not to make eye contact as he trembled with nervous energy. Kathy had been terrified of horses her whole life, which meant that the last time he'd been on a horse, hell, so much as touched one, was on his 10th birthday, shortly before he, she was born a decade ago. Growing up in the country back home, he probably would have had his own horse if it weren't for her. Horses and water, she was terrified of both, and would hate being where he was now. The thought made him smile. The creature shifted. And for the first time, he saw that it wore a bridle and saddle. He almost laughed in surprise, but it quickly died in his throat. The horse was prepared for riding, so where was the rider? He stumbled further onto the bank, but in the darkness, there was no sign of another person. Duncan glanced back toward the horse. It was still standing there waiting, following him with its eyes. He squinted at the ground, searching the bank for footprints, but all he could make out besides his were those of the horse. The creature must have run away or broken loose somehow. A stupid grin broke over his face as the horse nickered quietly. Someone was missing their horse and here he'd gone and found it. He could ride it back to town, maybe even be rewarded for bringing it back. His mind filled with fantasies of having the money to buy his own horse, maybe even this very one. Stepping carefully, so to keep himself in clear view of the creature, Duncan, Duncan closed the distance between them. The horse only watched him with calm, dark eyes. Carefully, he extended a hand like he'd been taught, 
letting it catch his scent. The creature snuffled against his palm, its whiskers tickling his skin. When it raised its head, Duncan allowed himself to relax. I'm going to climb up now, he murmured, shifting sideways and placing his hands on the empty saddle. His limbs ached from exhaustion, but he forced himself to wait and make sure the horse understood. Finally, moving more stiff and awkward than he remembered, he maneuvered himself atop the horse and into the saddle. He was surprised by its patience and how still it stood for him as he scrambled clumsily. There was a horrible moment where he pictured the creature bolting now that he'd mounted, but his panic subsided when the horse merely flicked its tail. Okay, he was back on a horse. Now what? Duncan worked to remember the directions for how to steer a mount. He knew people clucked their tongue. His heart sank when he realized that everything he knew might be completely useless. He was in another country, and for all he knew, they used completely different signals when training their horses. Home, he announced lamely. Nothing. He tried again, this time attempting a Scottish accent that sounded god-awful even to his ears. The horse snorted, possibly offended, or maybe it was laughing at him. Out of ideas, he tried to cluck his tongue, the sound coming out completely unnatural. At first, nothing happened, but the ho then the horse either got the message or simply tired of waiting. It started forward, plodding along the bank in the direction he'd been headed. It was easy to appreciate the surrounding landscape now that his aching muscles had a chance to rest, though the way the horse's movements jostled him never let him get too comfortable. The rolling hills would be breathtaking under the sunrise now that he could enjoy the view properly. What a turn the last few minutes had taken. Such a beautiful place, and at long last, he was riding again. Truly, this was kismet. He thought of Kathy and shook his head. She didn't want him near horses, and she didn't want him near water. If only his cell hadn't died. It would have been so much fun telling her about the horse he'd found on the shore of Loch Lamond. He could, have pra he could practically hear her screech of horror. No, Dunny, I saw it. I dreamed it. Stay away from the horses. Run from the water as fast as you can. Nonsense. Childish bullshit. He shoved the thought aside, choosing instead to examine the hillside on the opposite bank. What it, was that part of the Highlands? He didn't know about Scot he didn't know much about Scotland, but there would be plenty of time to learn once he'd claimed his reward and taken a good long nap. For the first time he noticed that the horse had drifted closer to the water's edge. You thirsty or something? Duncan asked, puzzled as it plodded along the shore at, the, at a clear angle now toward the loch. Hey, he reached out a hand and patted the horse's massive neck. No drowning my shoes. I mean it. That's the worst. Maybe he would pick a different horse with the reward money after all. But when his hand found the horse's neck, there was an unexpected coldness to it. The wet hair was almost slimy, and he could feel the stomach-churning sensation of the creature's skin pulling apart under the slightest pressure from his palm. Duncan blinked. In the glow of the moonlight, the horse's mane which had been black moments ago, was now tinged a dark green, as though it were seaweed instead of animal hair. He tried to retract his hand, only to discover that he couldn't. With a yelp of surprise, he tried yanking harder. The slimy skin rustled and broke under the slightest pressure, but his palm remained glued to the steady, shifting muscle underneath. He started at the splash of water and caught a glimpse of the horse's hooves marching steadily into the lock. For the first time, dread pooled in his gut. He pulled on the reins with his free hand, desperate to turn the mount ar around back to shore. The creature responded with a sound Duncan had never heard a horse make, something between a whinny and a banshee scream. The sound echoed back at him off the surrounding hills. I saw it! His sister's voice repeated nonsensically in his head. Not so funny anymore. I dreamed it! Stay away from the horses! He screamed as the creature reared up, towering ominously over their reflection. He caught sight of his own face, ghastly pale but it was the beast beneath him that drew his attention. Its eyes were vacant sockets, its ears flattened against his head. The tint of green was now undeniable. The horse-like creature had kelp for hair. And when the seconds slowed as terror exploded in his chest, the creature drew its lips back to reveal a set of terrible, metal-like teeth. He shouldn't have been able to stay on its back. He had no experience with rearing horses, but like his hand, he was glued to the saddle. The creature lunged into the lock, and Duncan was submerged before he could process what was happening. The water rushed over him, swallowing him whole and silencing his terrified scream. 
And I think I'm gonna stop there. All right, thank you. So yeah, so you obviously picked uh, for that one like a Kelpie, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm like, this is definitely Kelpie nope, vibes. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, um, remind us again where we can find your, uh, you and your writing, and then we're gonna bring everyone uh, back for a couple of minutes and just um, see if anyone has any questions kind of thing. Okay, well, I am found on Twitter and Instagram at, at Shelby Suderman. And I have an author Facebook page now, I believe is Shelby Suderman author page. All so right. It should be perfect. easy to find. Yeah, Shelby Suderman author page. That sounds pretty <laughs> Dot com? No, no, <laughs> not yet. All right, then. Okay, um, I'm going to add everyone back to the screen. So if you are in the background, I'm not warning you. I'm just doing it. Boom. Hello. Well, that was the warning. That was the warning. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming by. Let's see this um, Monsters and Mayhem one more time. Wow. <laughs> Hmm. This is that man. You need to get a copy. This one's mine. Whee! I still think that's adorable. I know it's terrifying for a lot of people, but I find that adorable. Yeah. Um, but um, before we say goodbye, I do want to ask everyone, what is if there was a monster that was real, okay. oh, Kevin Walsh was that sleep? Oh, great. Oh, great. Thank you, everyone, for reading and like telling us about your stories. And But I want to know if there was one monster that was real that we can't prove is real, uh, what's the monster that you would be the most scared of? Let's think about it for a second. Like, which one seems the most terrifying? Okay, I'll go first. Alien, the, the face hugger in Alien. I saw that as a child and it ruined me. <laughs> that is one of my favorite movies because I saw it as a child. I saw it as, that day. I'd, um, I'd uh, been doing long jump and I would pulled my a ligament in my knee. So I was in pain. So I was up. I couldn't sleep. My dad's, I was must be in about 10 or 11. And my dad said, well, Stay up then, son, because you can't sleep. I on you. Let's watch this film. It's <laughs> it's and I kid you not, I spent three nights sleeping under the bed afterwards. The one where and, comes and out every of night since. <laughs> so yeah, I never got. Over I, I kind of had the same experience with. I think the one that I would pick because I am terrified of zombies. Oh. Okay. I absolutely hate them. I can't watch any film with them. And when I was about ten. I watched um, Shaun of the Dead, <laughs> Shaun of and the Dead. you know the, the tamest zombie um, movie. And I every feel so movie. old right now. Okay. Ten. Ten. Shaun of the Shaun Dead when you were ten. Oh my! <laughs> and um, I there's a particular zombie in it. He's like a, a zombie that obviously went to a wedding when he was bitten. He's like in a wedding outfit, and he stumbles through the door of the house. And I had nightmares for like a week that this zombie was going to come through my bedroom door. <laughs> yeah. It's zombies. It's zombies all the way. Son of the dead. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great, it's a great movie. So, okay, so we have someone, aliens from the alien movie, zombies. Okay. What else just terrifies you? Something that terrifies me is talking to a grown adult who was 10 when Shaun of the Dead came out, <laughs> which I consider being a modern film. <laughs> Like it's a great film. It's it's one of my top like ten because it's uh, hilarious. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I'd have to go kind of alien with Chris. This isn't a horror film. I was freaked out by ET for a very long time when I was a kid, and I'm still kind of freaked, freaked out by ET because e there's nothing there's nothing cute or endearing <laughs> about ET. It's a freaky looking thing. It's weird. It has weird long fingers and a weird head. It sounds weird, like yeah. you know. It's just, it's just, it's not nice. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I hate, I hate ET. I wish that the uh, the government people had shot him, and that was the end of it. Wow, yeah. harsh. 
Um, Ian or Shelby. You know, I uh, I remember watching. Uh, keep yelling, Eloise. Sorry, my screen. You know, I remember watching Poltergeist as a kid, and uh, being sort of utterly terrified because I was living in the suburbs, and it's all like a suburban horror story. And uh, I think that that for me was was uh, was damn spooky. So I'd say, yeah, Poltergeist, and then maybe you know something like The Shining was sort of the evolution. When I saw The Shining for the first time and the, the twins in the hallway, I was kind of like, wow, what what is this? This is horrible and also amazing. So yeah. we're going to get more. So like the poltergeist, ghost, that kind of monster, yeah. Me yeah, because that, that like, be, that's mean, the one that would freak me out. I, think I mean, so. zombies are scary, but I mean, you can run them over with a car and <laughs> aliens are scary, but I mean, an insecticide maybe, I don't know. But ghosts, like, you know, what it are you going to do? You can't do anything. That's right. And, and ghosts that are twins, and ghosts that are twins are equally uh, are worse because twins are also terrifying as well. Well, and, and children are spooky. You know, children yeah. are just creepy. And uh, twins, yeah. I mean, Especially forget redheads. it. Forget it. <laughs> hey, Shelby, what scares yeah. you? What scares me? Uh, probably sea monsters, I think. Like, the idea of, like, you know, you see those pictures of, like, just how deep the ocean is. And just this idea of, like, something grabbing you and just dragging you. And it goes on and on and on and on and darker. And it just it keeps going forever. And, like, the pressure. But, like, this idea that, like, there's something there and it could, like, grab you and, like, bring you all the way down. Like, I don't watch a lot of sea monster horror movies because of that. I mean, I watch, like, The Meg and stuff like that. And I also read them. But... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't have a, a specific movie I can pick for that, but yeah, like if you look at uh, like just the sea monster of the ocean. is a valid answer because it is terrifying. Yeah, it's not only a you're gonna drown if yeah. it gets you, but b like who knows what the who knows what's there. So yeah, there's so many uncharted areas, and it's some, big. Some Somewhere in Brighton, Tim Mendes has just sat up like this. And he's like, <laughs> yes. he's, he's had the cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming today and for being a part of this and also submitting your stories. It means so much that you guys um, submit and write for us. Um, I know some people have stories on the back burner that they're like, oh, this fits, but some like the people that also um, write specifically for some of our calls like it means so much to us because we again like we're just a small publishing house um it's me and then a bunch of volunteers that help read through a lot of stories and really make um this publishing house what it is so i i appreciate you guys so much for being here and being a part of it and um i really hope that people pick the book up it's a really great book. It's a fun collection of, again, 24 stories. Um, e, I want to say Ian. I am okay. Ian. Right. Yeah. Uh, show us that book again, because you are the only one that actually has a copy. And we'll Happily. end on that. Very good. All right. How does how does it flip? Is it a good flip? Oh, it, it's got the best flip. It's, a, it's got a good weight to it. Um, it's, real, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's got a nice thick sort of paper yeah. stock is excellent. Good. Beautiful. It's a very a nice good book. girth. That's, that's what I like in my book. It's got those nice <laughs> images on the inside at the start. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I start, I'm starting to do a little bit more um, like full page uh, spreads on the paperback. So I'm really excited to see because I love how that first first couple pages turned out. I think it looks really cool and like every chapter page. So for people that pick up the paperback or the hardcover, it does have illustrations inside of it. Well, yeah, it's got a little bit more than your just basic variety um, thing. But thanks so much again, everyone, for being here. It was a pleasure to talk to you guys. And um, um, again, please buy the book. Support, support our authors. Support me. <laughs> support indie publishing. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, guys. I'm going to do the thingy one more time and then we're out. So again, thank you all for joining and have Bye. a great day.